Hi, my name is Russ Jenkins. You've seen me before, uh, but I have a special treat for you this week. Um, coming up uh, during the week, there's there's two videos that uh, I want to share with you. Uh, Andy Cook, I hope you remember him from our uh, Bible Emphasis Weekend. Uh, he was our main speaker. Uh, he shared with us a lot of things uh, as far as uh, places in uh, Israel, showing us those places and explaining the uh, events that happened there. Uh, well, he's got two videos that he wants to show this week, and, and I want to share with you um, one about uh, the crossroads, and the other is called Good Friday. And so uh, this one about the crossroads, we, we're going to show you today. Um, it was about uh, a week before the crucifixion. Uh, during that time, Jesus was headed toward Jerusalem with uh, a lot of folks because it was Passover and they were all headed towards Jerusalem. Uh, well, during that time, um, they're coming from Galilee. They have to go through Jericho. And Jericho is a crossroads in many different ways. And uh, Andy will tell you about that. But one of the things that happened there in Jericho was Jesus pulled his disciples away and talks to them face to face. And he says, see, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. All this celebration that was going on as they were going to the Passover, uh, they thought Jesus was going to be the political Messiah. But Jesus tried to tell the uh, disciples that this wasn't the case. So Andy is going to uh, share with us uh, some of the things that, that went on there at uh, Jericho and why it was the crossroads, uh, a very special place uh, in Israel. So join me now as we listen to Andy and as he tells us of the important events at the crossroads, Jericho, uh, these events changed the lives of the disciples. And these lessons of Jesus can change our lives as well as we journey to the cross. The land of the Bible has lessons for us. Uh, sometimes these lessons are so profound, they seem like secrets that have been hidden from us. But these secrets, they're hidden in plain sight. I like to call them secrets from the ancient path. On Palm Sunday, as we think about the last week of the life of Jesus, some of these secrets come into play, some of these new insights come into play at Jericho, at the crossroads of Jericho. The disciples of Jesus learned something as they were leaving Jericho. It was a painful lesson, but they learned something that would completely transform the way they would follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. This is especially in, in, in true in context of what they saw at the cross and, of course, at the resurrection after Jesus was crucified. They're a week away from the crucifixion when they get to Jericho, one week exactly. Now, Jericho is a crossroads community, two major highways intersect here. All of those thousands of travelers, even tens of thousands of travelers coming from the Galilee down the Jordan River Valley would come to Jericho. They would rest. They would at least get something to eat. Many of them spent the night and then they began the long trek up to Jerusalem and they would do that in one hike. Now that's where Jesus and the disciples were. As, as Luke says, they, they came into Jericho and were passing through. They would eat lunch with Zacchaeus, you remember. And then that afternoon, they were going to make this eight mile hike up to Jerusalem. Now the Bible always refers to this journey as going up to Jerusalem. Boy, they're not kidding. The writers of the Bible are not kidding when they say up to Jerusalem. Jericho is the lowest city on earth. Jerusalem's perched way up on the Judean mountain range. And that 18 mile climb, man, that's a it, it's an incredible walk. Can you imagine how frightening it must have been on this narrow path with the canyon gaping below you? Well, all of that's yet to come as the disciples and Jesus 
come into Jericho. And, and there's, there's more to Jericho than just the, the crossroads meeting a geographic central meeting point. Jericho is a place where cultures met and, and collided, really. I mean, we're, we're talking about class culture. We're talking about understanding of what it means to worship God. So many things were happening at Jericho. It helps us understand the context of everything Jesus had to say here and what he did here. For instance, there's not just one Jericho. There's actually two Jerichos. There's a lower Jericho and there's an upper Jericho. Now, in Hebrew, Upper Jericho is pronounced Jericho Elite, E-L-I-T-E in English. We understand what elite means. It's for the upper crust. Well, Jericho Elite uh, is, is a little higher in elevation than Lower Jericho, but it was very much for the upper crust of Israel. This was a winter resort for the richest people in Israel. If, if you can imagine the tower that was overlooking the canyon, there was a bridge that stretched across the canyon going to a major palace. All of this belonged to Herod the Great. You'll remember him from the Christmas story. And by the time Jesus came along on this particular day, Herod was long dead. His sons were enjoying the resort at Jericho. And some of the other richest people in Israel, including some of the priests, the high priest and his his associates up from up at the temple. Uh, an artist has illustrated what this might have looked like. Just imagine the nicest homes in your community. Put the green grass down, the fancy gardens. Remember, we're in a desert environment. And then picture all of those thousands of people who would never experience the enjoyment of a swimming pool. They wouldn't know the fine food of the palaces or the dining areas. And they were walking right by this neighborhood. I, I think of it sometimes as the country club of Israel. Nothing particularly wrong with a country club except, I don't know if you remember what I said a moment ago, the high priest and his associates and many of the leading priests, the Sadducees from Jerusalem had homes here. And the question would be, if you're a poor person from the Galilee, from Nazareth, Capernaum, or Capernaum, and you've walked all this way, it's taken three, four days just to get this far, and you've got to still walk all the way up to Jerusalem, the question would be, why does the high priest have a second home, a second palace down here at Jericho? The answer, everybody knew this, is the priesthood was incredibly corrupt. If you wanted to get rich in Israel when Jesus was alive, one of the easiest ways to do that was to manage to get yourself into the business of religion. The temple was so corrupt, Jesus was furious at the Sadducees. Remember one of the first things he did as he got to Jerusalem on this last week of his life? He went into the temple and he starts turning over tables and running out the money changers. The people who benefited from that economic, unethical activity were the priests, the high priest. Jesus was furious at them, and he wasn't the only one. Not long before uh, this particular day, a man named John, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, had been baptizing people at the nearby Jordan River. And the priests, the Sadducees, had made the short journey from Jericho over to see what this lunatic was saying. And when they showed up, John blisters them, calls them a brood of vipers. Who told you to flee the coming wrath? John was absolutely incensed at the priest, at the Sadducees. And, and he had a message that was so hard for them to hear. Many of them decided, this man needs to die. And one of Herod's sons decided he would take care of that problem. And indeed, he executed John the Baptist. Now, now you've got this collision of understanding how to worship God all coming together here at Jericho. The high priest sees religion as a way to make an enormous amount of money. The, the commoners from the Galilee region coming to Jericho and making that long hike up to Jerusalem just because God asked them to come and they loved God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. Now, I know they weren't perfect people, but they were trying to do what God asked them to do. And Jesus and his disciples come in. Jesus has a new message and people are struggling to connect with it, even though they're excited to be around him. And he comes in and, 
and there's a parade. There's a blind man that's healed on the way in and he's leading the parade. And then Jesus meets Zacchaeus and the parade dies down for a few minutes. I mean, Zacchaeus is not a popular man. He's, he's collected taxes. He's in bed with the Romans. He's, he's been cheating the local people. But as Jesus is in the home of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus has a heart change. And he announces that he's about to start handing out tax rebates and the parade starts again. Everything's so excited and the, and, and, the, and the parade leaves and Jesus and the disciples begin to leave and it looks like things are back on track. And then a monkey wrench is thrown in the whole thing and I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'll come back to that in a minute. I, wanna, I want you to see one more area that comes into play in this crossroads of Jericho, and that would be the Qumran community. The men who were part of something called the Essene movement had come down from Jerusalem. Some of them had been in the priestly business. Some of them had been priests, and they walked away from that opportunity to make money and be powerful, and they came down to Jericho, and amazingly, nobody turned south. They turned south, headed toward the Dead Sea. Obviously, you can't drink any of that water. It's full of salt. And they decided to make a community on the edge of the Judean wilderness. And, and, and the very fact that they lived there, I don't know, we should have never known about it. They didn't live there very long. There wasn't a community for, for a very long time. Look how hard it must have been to live in this environment. This is the Judean wilderness that you've heard so much about. John the Baptist comes out of the Judean wilderness. Jesus goes into the wilderness. It's a hard, hard location. The Essenes made a community here. We know about this community primarily because one of the things they did is they wrote a lot of things down, including scripture, on scrolls, and they hid their scrolls in the caves around the Qumran community. And in these caves, those scrolls were found. The first ones found in 1947. They immediately became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the most famous, most valuable archaeological find in all of history, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, the scrolls told us a lot about the Essene community, about what they believed, about the strict rules of all the rules they followed. They, they wouldn't speak to each other while they worked or while they ate. They, they were so meticulous about the way they copied scripture. The rules were very, very clear of how they would do this. And, and primarily they were focused on holiness. They were absolutely committed to living lives that were perfectly clean of sin. This was a community absolutely dedicated to that. And in this community, you, when you see the ruins of this community or other, or other communities around, you know, you're only looking at the foundations, not the whole buildings, just the, the foundations of what once were living quarters or dining halls or working rooms. Um, and you can also see in this area the, the aqueducts that ran water from one location to another. And already you're wondering, I hope, where did they get the water? They're living next to the Dead Sea. That water's no good to them. And in the desert, in this environment, it does not rain. Less than two inches of rain would fall a year. And yet they had these huge places to hold the water, the aqueducts that ran along the ground. Um, and they had special places to be immersed in a ritual cleansing act. If you're familiar with the, the Christian tradition, this is what we call baptism. These men would be immersed multiple times a day in an effort to be right with God. They would go down on the right side of one of these mikvahot. This mikvah has a dividing line. You go down on the right side. You, you sit down in the water until you are completely right with God. So you, you're cleaned on the outside and you ask God to clean you on the inside. And when you are finally done, you exit on the opposite sides. You come in unclean, you leave clean. These men of the Qumran community, they get to the name of God as they're copying the scroll of Isaiah. The man in charge of that particular writing would, would go outside. He would be immersed in the mikvah, and he would, he would ask for forgiveness, come back, write down the name of God, go back and be immersed again in the mikvah, and then come back and continue to write. 
You look at this community, you'll actually see many, many places in this community where ritual washing took place. Now again, the question, where did they get all this fresh water? They had to have fresh water. They had to have a lot of it if they're going to be immersed in cleansing water multiple times a day. The answer is they went up in the hills, up in the canyons, and they built a dam. And now, if you look at the rocks, they had plenty of rocks to work with, but they only have their hands in the most fundamental of tools, primitive tools. And they worked out there in the heat. It's often more than 100 degrees in the heat of the day here. And they, they built these ground aqueducts that would have been covered. They're covered with plaster. You touch the rocks on this aqueduct, you'll, your hand will still come up dusty from the powder, from the plaster that was once here. Follow this aqueduct up into the hills and you'll see the, the way they designed. They built little bridges and, and they even carved the aqueduct to go through the rock. Now there's a dam they had built in a narrow opening of this wadi, of this canyon. And if you, if you go up in here and you can even climb up and you can crawl through the rock where they dug through the rock and you can see with your own eyes and feel the dust on your knees as you crawl through this area, how hard they worked just to build the dam and hope that when the flash floods come in the winter, they would, the dams would hold, and if a dam holds, a single flash flood might give them enough water for the entire year. And those men built that dam, and they built the aqueducts, and they maintained it all in the heat of the desert just so they could practice ritual purity. They could show God they were serious about holiness down there at the bottom of the Judean wilderness. Why in the world would they be so radical? Because the scripture they loved the most, the book of Isaiah, had told them that if you'll go to the wilderness, if you will go to the places of the rugged land, if you'll go to the places that are in the desert, if you will practice holiness enough, that's the, the way they read this passage, then Messiah will come. And oh, how they wanted to see the Messiah. They wanted to see the Messiah come. These Essenes actually were looking for three different Messiahs according to their writings. They wanted a political Messiah to be the king of the land. They wanted a military Messiah to lead the revolt that would get rid of the Roman Empire. And they wanted a spiritual Messiah who would show them how to live and how to live in holiness. They had it in their minds what the Messiah would look like. They, they were so convinced of this that nothing could change their mind. And what a pity that these men would miss the Messiah who actually may have walked right past their front door on the way to the Judean wilderness after he was baptized. And speaking of baptism... If they had just gone out, and they probably did on multiple occasions, and looked across the ridge, across the way, it wasn't very far to the Jordan River where John was baptizing. The, the writers of the Gospels describe John as a man who came out of that same wilderness environment, out of that same pursuit of holiness, and he called people to a radical new holiness. And where did Jesus announce the beginning of his ministry? He could have announced it in Capernaum where he had moved or Nazareth where he had grown up or Bethlehem where he'd been born or Jerusalem where he would eventually go. But Jesus comes to the Jordan River where John is baptizing just a short walk away from where a group of radical men are saying, if enough of us will be holy enough, long enough, Messiah will come. And that's where Jesus announced his ministry was beginning. All at the crossroads of Jericho. And now, three, three and a half years after the beginning of that ministry, Jesus brings his young disciples to Jericho. And there's excitement. There's the parade. Thousands of people already making their way up to Jerusalem. Many of them are tagging along with Jesus and the disciples. There's music. The blind man is, is leading the songs. Zacchaeus is singing along and dancing. People are so excited. And Jesus pulls his disciples aside one more time to say, look, don't forget why we're going to Jerusalem. Because I'm going to Jerusalem and that's where I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, to the Romans. 
I'm going to be scourged there, tortured there, crucified. Don't worry, I'll, I'll be raised to life on, that, on, on the third day. The disciples didn't hear it. They couldn't have possibly heard it. How do we know that? Because two of them, two of them, James and John of all people, two of the good ones, two that Jesus had so invested so much of his life in. Remember James, John, and, and Simon Peter, he had taken aside so many times. And Jesus says, what do you want? Their mother bows down before him, kneels down, and she says, I want one of my boys to be on your right, the other one on your left. Uh, it, we, in our language, in our culture today, maybe she would have said, I want one of my boys to be your vice president and one to be your secretary of state. They're good boys, Jesus. They, they, they deserve this. And the scripture says the others were indignant. The other 10 disciples were indignant. You know what indignant looks like in that particular case? It looks like Simon Peter who had been anointed the leader by Jesus, going, James, John, what's up with this? You know, you forget about me? It, it, it looks like the disciples arguing over money and Bethany. It, you remember the woman poured out that expensive ointment, and they, ointment and, and they said, this could have been put in the treasury. The treasury is where they're going to get their paycheck. It, it looks like the disciples not wanting to wash anybody's feet or even get out the basin of water and a towel, because that's what a servant does. That's what a slave does. Had they forgotten that Jesus said, if you want to be first, you've got to be the slave of all? And it looks like Judas, indignant Judas, going, well, if James and John are going to make their move, I guess it's time I'll make mine. It doesn't take much indignation to kind of destroy the motivation, the, the momentum of this entire movement. And it left Jesus to wonder if maybe, maybe he had picked the wrong 12 disciples. Maybe he'd invested his energy in the wrong three. And he walks by himself on that lonely road all the way up to Jerusalem. Just when he had needed the disciples to be most unified, they're the most fractured because of selfishness, because of what James and John had done. Their mother had asked it, had voiced it, but James and John were responsible for this. They're the disciples. They're the ones who had walked with Jesus. It's, it, it's just tragic. Now, one week... One week from that particular day, Jesus is on the cross. You know, it, the week started with that grand entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And it looked for a while like things were going to go okay anyway. But by Thursday night, it, it had fallen apart. And then by Friday, it, it, it was in a disaster zone and Jesus was on the cross. At least John came to the cross and, and he... He's there at the foot of the cross with his mother. I don't know if you've seen that detail. She's also there, the mother of James and John. And she must have felt terrible by this point. And, and Jesus is there and he can hardly speak at all. But he does speak to John. I want you to listen very carefully to what he says. Jesus says, John, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. And he's asking John to take care of his mother. Now in the... If I could take a little bit of liberty to that, let me rephrase this. One week after James and John made this audacious request, this power play, that selfishness got in the way of, of their own relationship with their, with their brothers and with Jesus, frankly. Jesus says, you know, John, a week ago you asked me for that important job in the, commun in the kingdom. Well, I've got one for you. John, it, it's called elder care. I want you to take care of my mother. I know you're what, 17 now? Look, if you take care of my mother, and I'm asking you to do that, you're going to have to, you're going to have to walk slower than you're accustomed to walking. You're going to have to spend some of your money on her needs. John, you'll have to get interested in what senior adult women are interested in if you're really going to take care of my mother, and she needs you to do this. I need you to do this. So, John, if you want an important job in the kingdom... Would you take care of my mother? And John did take care of her. Church history tells, 
tells us that he took care of her the rest of her life. And she died while still under his care. And, and then, then John was able to make an impact on the kingdom that he could have never imagined. It's like Jesus said, John, if you can learn how to take care of one person well, then you can lead my church. Then you'll understand the kingdom. Now, in this crisis that we're facing, here we are at home with our loved ones and, and we've got neighbors around us and, and, and it's, it's very easy to become self-focused. You want your marriage to be strong? Selflessness is going to be a key. If you wake up in the morning wondering, how can I best serve my spouse this morning? And all day long you think of that spouse, you think of him, you think of her all day long, all the way to the evening goes, your marriage is going to get richer and richer and richer if both of you have the same concept and are focusing on that. It, at work, if you want to make profit, concentrate on service because people will come to a business that serves them well. They will honor that business. You want to destroy your business? You want to stop the profit? Forget about service. Students are so focused on popularity. Students, listen to me. The way to be popular, this is such a simple Jesus concept. Stop thinking about yourself and try to make other people around you popular. Focus on their popularity, and in no time at all, you'll be the most popular person in your circle. That's just the way it works. And in church, you know, you stick around church life long enough, you probably know from experience that it only takes one, two people or a small group to, to really hurt the momentum of a church. I mean, it can all come grinding down. As fast as James and John can make a, a move of selfishness down at Jericho, you know, people can, can make a mistake in a church and it can hurt for a long time. You know how to recover from it? You, you walk in the door of your church not thinking, how can this church meet my needs? How can this church do music that I will like? How can this church, you know, take care of my kids? It's, it's, it's how can me and our, how can our family best serve this community through this body of believers? You walk in the door with a spirit of, of serving others You'll be doing what Jesus asked us to do, and you will create a church that cannot be stopped, even if a coronavirus crisis stops us from gathering together in a building. And that's where we are this Sunday. And, and that's, that's where we are maybe for an indefinite period of time. Who knows? But we have an opportunity here to make a real difference for the kingdom. To, to do what Jesus asked us to do, to never forget the lesson from the crossroads of Jericho. May it, by God's grace, change us all forever. God, thank you for drawing us together today. Thank you for the technology that has allowed us to do this like no other generation could have done. Now, as we move through these trying times, I pray that we would see that every crisis is actually an opportunity. And this is an opportunity for us to, to be stronger as a community of faith, to have a greater witness to the community outside of our church family, and to make a difference inside our own families that can make us stronger followers of Christ and can make this time, instead of one of those times we, we remember with, with, with regret and grief, though there probably is a lot of stress and anxiety and even grief around it, May it be known as one of the times when we drew closer together because we were modeling the love of Jesus as we served one another. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.